Welcome back to New Record Day. My name is Ron and folks, we have another Tuesday Tech Talks waiting for you. Uh, before we get started, I just wanted to give you an update or a heads up on the sound clips for the modified Klipsch RP600M. I'm about halfway done and I'm, I'm sorry that it's taken as long as, as it is. Uh, I want to make sure that it's all about quality. Uh, for those that have been following along with some of the sound clips that I've been doing lately, I'm not just throwing up any old microphone and calling it a day. I take my time, I make sure that it's done as, as well as I can, and I wanna be able to give you guys a great, um, a great sound clip, something that you can put on a pair of headphones and maybe hear some of the differences between those two speakers. And I even did some sound clips between the, uh, the binding posts and the tube connectors. And I will tell you, I was surprised with how that all went. Anyhow, it's gonna be cool. You guys are totally gonna to dig it. And that will be out shortly. So just give me a couple more days to wrap that up and I will release that video. Enough blabbering, enjoy the show. Uh, this is gonna be a little bit different than what we've been doing. Uh, Danny has had a, a friend stop by at GR Research. His name is Tyson. Uh, he goes by Tyson on the Audio Circle forums. And uh, Tyson used to do some uh, show coverage uh, reviews. And uh, they kind of talk about the evolution of hi-fi reviews, where things have been and where things are going, which was obviously for me something really cool to listen to and kind of hear their perspective and just kind of how they fleshed everything out. Um, also, Tyson talks a little bit about his rig now being primarily do-it-yourself and how that hasn't always been the case. So he talks about what it took to get him there. And that was encouraging for me to hear that, that even though he had to rely on some local, you know, help with building the cabinets, that just goes to show there's a lot of different ways that you can get into do it yourself. So if you are apprehensive about doing it because you don't have woodworking skills, don't worry about that. You certainly could hire somebody to help you out. And I feel pretty confident in saying that you're still going to get great value if you decide to go in that direction, which is really what do-it-yourself is all about, is saving money and getting high performance for far less than you know buying manufactured speakers. That's not to say that do-it-yourself is the only way to go. There are many manufactured speakers that I absolutely love, and I would purchase them without even batting an eye, and that is even taking into consideration that I'm not afraid to do it yourself. I'm not afraid to actually get out there and build speakers, crossovers, the whole shebang. So, cool perspectives, cool conversation. I'm gonna stop talking now. Enjoy the show. Hey everybody, welcome back to another Tuesday's Tech Talk. Today's a little, uh, little different than uh, normal. I have a guest with me, Tyson, and uh, I'll introduce Tyson and let you guys know what he's done and how he's contributed to the audio community and uh, we're going to talk about reviewers, reviews and reviews in general and how they've progressed to this point where you're watching us now on YouTube videos and uh, I guess you started out um, doing the shows there at Rocky Mountain Audio Fest. It's been quite a while. Yeah. That's kind of when we first met. Well and it's interesting because like I never was a professional reviewer, right? I yeah. just was just some schmuck who was really interested in audio and just happened to be lucky enough that I lived in Denver where they brought in the world's best equipment every year. Every year. And I got to go, I mean, I could drive 20 minutes from my house to one of the premier audio events every year, year after year after year. Yeah. So it was, a, it was a really cool time to be an audiophile. So 20, yeah. oh my God, 20 years ago. Yeah, it's been a while. 20 years I think has been gone. So I'm getting old. Well, at some point you and your buddy Pez kind of took things to another level and started doing pretty much live coverage of the show. Yeah, so we evolved. So first, I didn't know Jason, um, who, well, oh, Jason. <laughs> Sorry, Jason, I outed you. You're out now. Pez. Pez. <laughs> <laughs> so um, yeah, we, we didn't know each other at first and we didn't do show coverage at first. We both went independently. Um, and so I had a few years where I went by myself and then after a while, Jason and I became friends and uh, we tried to do show coverage like everyone else, which was, hey, let's go to a bunch of rooms. And then later on that night, 
we'll try to decipher our notes and type it up from the notes later on and that we did that for a year we did that for several years um and that was terrible because you know, yeah. by the time the night rolled around, like, you probably had some sure. wine or... <laughs> Forgot half the stuff you did. Yeah. 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 Which room was that? Oh, which speakers did that look like? <laughs> and so it was this uh, incredibly difficult logistical problem of how do you get impressions uh, over the course of three days when you're hitting maybe 30 rooms a yeah. day. Yeah. And, like, it's impossible. You can't. You can't rely on your memory. That's what I learned. Well, one year I know there was 550 vendors that had active, you know, products on display. Yes. So you could, I don't know how many rooms there were total, but you could almost not hit them all during the show. Well, I'll tell you this. So here's our other story. So we got better at it. So what we ended up doing was uh, I would down, so there was a list of vendors you could download to a, a spreadsheet. Yeah. And it had everybody by floor. And so I would go in ahead of time and I would mark off all of the interesting vendors floor by floor by four several weeks mm -hmm. in advance and then Jason and I would discuss like who are we going to hit and why are we going to hit that particular room who have we hit in the past like where's gaps um, because the fact is with 500 plus rooms you literally like even if you ran from room to room to room it won. is physically impossible to hit that many in that time yeah, yeah. and if you want to do it justice um you have to be methodical and you have to be willing to say you know what sorry some rooms are going to get skipped like yeah i wish we could hit all of them but you can't so. yeah i know i used to hit uh, after hours a lot of us that all knew each other at the show you know we'd see each other every year we were friends we were colleagues we showed together shared product or bought from one another we would Try to meet up at the end of the days or something and visit each other's rooms and right. get in a little listening time to see what's new and stuff but it, it was really tough for a vendor it was we, we couldn't just get out no like, that was funny I, it was, I i was able to walk around from room to room and i could get a feel for the state of the industry just mm -hmm. by walking around i could see what was the best and the worst at a right. particular show um and there was some really great stuff and there was some brief spectacular failures yes. too um that's true but vendors i realized they don't get a chance to see that because you're they're stuck in the room for three days room. so they can't really go out and see what's going on yeah some of them don't realize how good some of the rooms really are right or how bad some most of them really are Dude, i have to say in the early days nobody brought room treatment Zero, like maybe maybe one or two I in the so whole first show. Year. Yeah, all right, okay, I'll give you props. But so. like ninety eight percent, no. And so one of the things we started noting was this room might not suck if you had room treatments, but you don't, so it sucks. And we would post like in real yeah. time. Yeah, um, you guys were brutal at first. You guys, yeah, were, you laid it right up. This <laughs> room was bad. Well, <laughs> when we were first doing it, nobody read us. Yeah. So like we could be snarky and have fun and go crazy and like be sort of brutally honest. Yeah. And uh, what, what ended up happening, so I want to talk a little more about our process before yeah, we go yeah, on to, sure. to other stuff. But what we ended up doing was, uh, so I would download the spreadsheet, we would talk about what we wanted to hit, um, and then eventually we had worked out the process so that we would have a disc of five different songs radically different genres everything yep. from like classical vocal to um well jason so i got to pick three tracks and then jason got to pick two crappy tracks so like if i <laughs> never hear uh the civil wars ever again it will like seriously i listen to civil wars 40 times and i hate that song and jason of course like yeah let's do it next year no Anyway, so we would rotate, like, but we would have a consistent playlist, right. and so we would agree on that ahead of time, and then I would rip 60 seconds, so that was our limit. 60 seconds of this song, 60 seconds of Johnny Cash, 60 seconds of uh, Tool, 60 seconds of Mahler, and then we would take that, give it to a person, press play. There's only one track, and then right. it, in, within less than five minutes, we would be able to hear exactly what a system was capable of uh, in, in a very thorough manner. Yep, I remember y'all doing that. I remember y'all coming into my room with, you always had your music Yes. ready to go. This is what we want to hear. Yes, and uh, so what we were able to do is once we had the music going, uh, and then we'd done that a few times and we kept trying to type up our notes at night and that was a horrible failure, because it was all memory. Um, we decided, you know, we should, we have like this awesome new thing called uh, 
personal hotspots. Like yeah. we could just type up our impressions while we're in the seat. Like I could just bring my laptop, hook it up to my phone, and then you know, internet out, and then I'll type stuff up while Jason takes pictures, and I'll have my three tracks at the beginning. So he has three minutes to take amazing photos. I have three minutes to get the basic structure of each room set up and start typing initial impressions and then specific songs for my three. Then he types up his two, we switch. So he jumps into my seat, yeah. I jump out. He starts typing up his impressions. Yeah. And we did everything independently. So we would give impressions right next to each other in the same room at the same time. And the crazy thing was, we didn't always agree. Yeah. Right? Like we would, <laughs> we would sometimes be like, oh, I love that room. And he would be like, are you on crack? <laughs> that was a terrible room. So. It just goes to show that even with two highly seasoned audio files with the same right. music in the same room in the same spot, you don't always agree, right? right? So there's an inherent subjectivity to our. But it's funny for me to watch and, and and with you specifically to watch you progress in your level of of expectation and and what you know as a as a performance bar. Yes. You know, you got to where your personal system was better and better, and you become quite the listener. You were sure. very good at critiquing, and the show coverage that you guys gave became the best show coverage of the show. You know, everyone was watching <laughs> well, yeah. Tyson and Pez. That's why know. we stopped, actually. Yeah. We quit because yeah. too many people started reading. A and lot. So yeah. what happened was after, like, and I think this is a dilemma that anybody who does any reviews, whether it's YouTube or <laughs> magazines or anything, they're gonna run into this ethical dilemma. And I, the only way I could solve it is I just walked away. Like we just quit. Right. Um, I still do some show coverage, but it's really sort of, you know, <laughs> on the slide. It's not, it's like, it's barely trying. It's basically just like some pictures and right. a few notes. So, but back in the day, we were making a real attempt to get people like, here's the excitement of the show. This is what's happening. This room was great. This room wasn't. This is why this room was mediocre or this one was bad or this one was awesome. Right. Um, and what we found was people started asking us to go into specific rooms and give their our impressions of specific rooms. Right. Well, the underlying assumption is that you're going to say something great about their room, which is great if they have a great room, great room. but what if they don't? And so yeah. now people are watching. And so what I realized is, oh, people are looking, people are watching. And in the old days, I could say whatever I wanted because like we were just two chumps typing stuff and yeah. we had complete freedom because we had no audience. <laughs> and now right. that we have an audience and it became something became that, a big audience, yeah. Like we set records for page views on Audio Circle for yes. years with those threads. Everybody couldn't wait to know the show coverage from Tyson and Pez. Right. There we go. And, and so, it was day by day. It was like really it was just scrolling in at, at real time. Yes. You know, right then it was like you were uploading right. immediate impressions. Yeah. And what happened was I can't be negative was what I realized. If I'm right. negative, first off, Jason may not agree. So I'm putting out a negative opinion. The other thing is if people are watching and I say some, if I trash a room because I thought it sucked um, and I thought a lot of rooms sucked, that's affecting somebody's livelihood. Yeah. Right. And you know, the big companies like Wilson, who consistently is not particularly good, or Dynaudio, which was consistently mediocre, like, like even at that level, right. they don't care. They don't care. Though. They don't care. Like I could take pot shots at them, and I do, because they're not that great. Yeah, they really don't <laughs> have to turn the system on. They just have to be there and let people see their right. name. And, and and they do beautiful work. You look at they them. Have they, they, they have great art. They have great products, but they don't necessarily set their stuff up well. It shows they right. don't exhibit. They brought no room treatment. They plop a quarter million dollars worth of gear in the floor and they just turn it on. Right. And you know, there'll be reviewers that'll come by and they'll set up something for later where they'll get product. Because that's what they're, they're wanting. The reviewers want product and and it's somewhat of a shakedown. The magazines will kind of exploit them for a large amount of money for reviews and advertising and they'll hit them with a whole package and oh yeah. And then that's where they get their show coverage. I remember lots of times we had uh, show coverage, and some of the, the reviewers are really good. Um, and I wasn't going to really mention any names, but Stephen Stone would come by, hmm. and he would have his own music that he was, not was something he chose, it was something that he was actually playing the instruments in. Wow. So he knew it really well. And he would sit, and he would really listen. 
and I, I really respected it. He, he was listening specifically for stuff. And he, he often chose our room mm-hmm. as one of the best rooms. Of course, the last room, last time we were there, he chose ours as the best sound, cost no object. Which I agreed with him. Yeah, it was a good room that year. That, was, it, that year was the last year I actually did real show coverage. That I was, stopped it. That was an incredible setup that we had in that room. Uh, of course, every bit of the room was completely treated, diffusers, and we, we worked at it to yes. get there. So, and there's guys like that who I really respect as reviewers, but there's a lot of the reviewers that'll come in and, you know, they're just going to set something up for some other time, you know. And then there's times I've mm-hmm. where, where the, the magazine would contact me after the show and they'd say, oh, three of my reviewers were in your room and they all picked your room as one of the best rooms. And so that's going to get mentioned in the publication when we cover that. So you really need to hit this with ads. You know, really need to blanket the market with with advertisement to go along with it to really promote the product and just really put the pressure, you know. Right. Pushing wanting to wanting to get you for those advertisements. It, at some point it just felt like an unethical situation. Well it's funny it's funny you mention magazines because Pez and I, Jason and I got three job offers from magazines oh, yeah, to go and do show coverage. You bet. You were doing a great job. And like Jason was a little, I think Jason was a little <laughs> more tempted to do it. I was like no we're not like the moment you take money for anything where you're giving an opinion you have already put yourself in an almost untenable position where because it comes back to if you look at all the reviews why do you never see a negative review never you never see someone go hey i got the speaker it was terrible nobody ever does that no (laughs) because It wouldn't get published. Exactly. They would be losing their advertisers. Right. Now, I'm not saying that the things that get positive reviews get positive reviews because they're being paid. I'm saying that things that the reviewer likes gets yeah. reviewed and put out there because right. they like them. Because so they like them. There's definitely integrity within the process. Yes. But if anybody's ever wondering, like, why don't I ever see something that says that receiver from Sony was a piece of crap? Well, it's because they just don't yeah. publish it because you're, you're now trashing somebody's reputation. And yeah. That's really hard to do. And I couldn't. I couldn't. That's why I walked away. Reminds me of that uh, story I was telling the other day where I designed product for a company and we exhibited at CES and the reviewers loved it in the in the room and asked for reviews review models to be sent to them with uh, they had shipped the pair of speakers to the reviewer and they were damaged in shipment mm-hmm. one of the foil inductors had completely come off the inductor oh, i mean right. completely come off the crossover in shipping and it just needed repair and they wanted they asked me as the designer go up there to the reviewers and repair it and i don't want to do that i didn't have time to go fix the speaker and my buddy gary dodd said i'll do it you know, he was, of course, perfectly capable of doing it. Gary was one of the right. greatest designers in the industry of tube amps and tube gear, and he went up to fix it. So he goes to the guy's house, and it's a very prominent reviewer, I'll say that, very well known at a major publication. Gary said his room was not one you'd think of as a review room. Gear cluttered everywhere, no real room treatments. Um, and he said the interesting thing was he could hear four different radio stations coming through his system at the same time. Just right. so much RF noise. This is a reviewer. He says, how do you review through this stuff? He just learned to listen through it. And you're thinking, man, if people really realize that this is, this is the guy writing the reviews and he said, I'm going to listen through a bunch of radio frequency noise coming through the speakers. Well, and I think that comes to the, like, the other point we were talking about earlier, which is you can't really rely on secondhand information. Like, yeah. you can't really, like, reviewers are good to maybe give you a starting point of what to check out exactly. yourself. Exactly. But you don't really want to rely on yep. because the rooms are different. Like oh, I yeah. just in fact I just went through this with my so I'm here actually to upgrade my Klipsch speakers. Yeah. So hello Tech Talk Tuesday. Um, so we've been doing some DIY stuff which is really cool, which Been I think fun. we're gonna do a video yeah. on. We have his Klipsch Forte threes. Yes. That we're doing an upgrade on. Maybe we'll cover that another time. But the reason I brought them is, uh, well, first I was trying to kill some time. <laughs> so there's always that, and Danny's cool. So like, those are, those are really awesome reasons. But the other reason is I put up a whole bunch of room treatments in my upstairs uh, living area. <clears throat> and it went from very, very bright to very, very uh, soft and absorbent. Uh, and so the Klipsch sounded amazing with all of the things I'd done to tune them to that bright room but they sounded muted and a little dull when I had up my uh, new room treatment. So 
like, you know what? We should change the speakers. We should get them in, measure them, tweak them, bring mm. them up to spec, and then I'm sure once I get them back home, they will uh, they will be beautiful. Now, someone might say, well, why don't you just sell your speakers? Like, I could do that, but I really like the clips. They sound really good. Like normally I'm not a clips person because they're fair, they're yeah. they're fairly shouty. Like a lot of them are like strident and shouty. You know, they do some things really well, like transparency and dynamics. But the Forte 3 was really the first one where I'm like, oh, wow, that's smooth and refined, like more so than almost anything else. That's the one I want. Oh, and it fits nicely with my decor and it can be placed close to the wall. Like, sold, right? Yeah. So for me, I'm like, I like the bones of it enough that it's worth it to come bring it up here, rip it apart, see what's oh, yeah. inside of it. You know, get some real work done on it and make yeah. it to the next level. And it came up the day after Christmas. Or, so my wife was gone on a trip and it's like, okay, guys get to hang out and have some fun and measure and test some speakers. So that's what got him here. And then I roped him into doing this Tech Talk Tuesday <laughs> and said, let's talk about the stuff you used to do. Well, we should probably talk about, um, since we're going to tie this back to Tech Talk, um, we should probably talk about my sort of journey to DIY because I didn't true. start there. No. Like, oh no. We didn't at all. I was like, wait, you he can like, He was a, he was a typical customer of ours. <laughs> he did not start right. with DIY at all. Well, even before like I remember my first first high-end audio speaker was I think I was 22, 23 years old, Boston Acoustics. The BA8, I think it was called. <laughs> Um, but it sounded so good. Like I was a music lover before that. Like you know, from 14, 15, I had this like intense connection oh, to music. Yeah. I started right? the same way. But, but it seemed like other people didn't, right? And so I was on this sort of like, well, I really love music, and it's kind of, a, so I guess it's a private thing because not many people seem to share it. And then I found ran, and I wasn't an audiophile at all, and I was just a music lover. And then by chance, I happened to run across these speakers. Uh, I don't even remember where. And uh, I think it was like the Brahms German Requiem. Like, and I wasn't even into classical music at the time. And so we put, I put that on, and then like the big vocal chorus sort of creeps up and fills in. And I was like, I don't know what that is, but I want it. <laughs> yeah. And then that's when I became an audiophile. I had that transcendent musical experience where I'm like, oh, that's way better than what I've been listening to. But even then, I would buy the box. And I put it up, and it was um, it was mysterious, right? Like something happened inside of that box. Mm -hmm. Oh, we're getting blinking lights. We're getting low. It's I get a warning on that light, so ah. your battery's starting to get uh -oh. low. We better finish up quick. Yeah. All right. Um, oh, we got time. It'll stay on for a little bit longer. All right. Then, uh, ah, I think I was like most people, right? I liked sound. Yeah. I liked equipment. I bought it. It was like the it, but. The inner workings, like how does that amp work? How does this speaker, like, mm, I don't know. And if I open it up, I'll probably break it, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Like that's like, and, and I would have. I, I didn't know what I was doing. Um, and there wasn't the internet. I, I couldn't look things up yeah. and I couldn't figure things out. Uh, this generation doesn't know what it's like to live without the internet. Yeah, that's true. We didn't have it. <laughs> we didn't have the internet. You've you usually figured things out by breaking them. In the old days, that's I how you figured I take things apart. That's what I do. Um, yeah. But I did uh, I did the just buy it for a long time and then just stick it over there and then uh, it was so crazy I was so gullible at the time because whatever they would say in the marketing I would believe it yeah. because I didn't know any I had no basis to determine like what That's is where, what is for a lot of these young folks are BS they don't know what's real and what's, what's not. real right uh, and I can tell you this the best thing you can do is just go listen because you know what sounds yeah. good. Better than me, better than Danny, better than anybody else because they're your ears and yeah. they're your preferences. The best thing you can do after hitting Rocky Mountain for like 20 years, you never know what's gonna sound good. It's always surprising. It's true. So go listen. Um, oh, my journey. So two, I bought these great speakers one year at Rocky Mountain uh, from Brian Cheney. A VMPS audio. Yep. Oh, we've I think, lost. I it. think our light's gone. We're gonna have to cut. We have to cut and ah! plug it in. All right, right back. All right, so we're back. We're back after uh, getting our lighting situation back on. So, so, I was talking about my DIY journey. Yeah. So I'll try and make it quick. Um, basically, what happened was I had some really excellent tower speakers that I loved. 
in a condo. And they were, they, I loved them. In fact, I stopped going to Rocky Mountain for I think three or four years in the middle because I was like, I already have what I like, right? Yeah. So there's no point in me going to the show. But there was something about them that always bugged me and it was my room was uneven. Like on one side of my couch, so I'm sitting on my couch, on one side is a closed wall and my speaker and on the other side was an open area where my dining room was. And so one speaker had almost no bass and the other speaker had overwhelming yeah. bass. And that's when I started to DIY because I started investing in electronic crossovers and other sort of really sophisticated approaches to try and fix my bass issue. Yeah. You know, cause I like, I love bass. Like I'm, I'm all about the bass. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> that's a really bad reference to a, a Megan Trainor song, I think, which I know cause I have a 13 year old daughter. Oh, uh, <laughs> anyway, um, so uh, like I had this bass issue and I was trying to fix it. Uh, so I started dipping my toes in. Well, if I get a crossover uh, and some EQ, I can like sort of dial that down and dial this up and change things. And it was really empowering because I got to see that it wasn't magic. Like it was just a certain set of parameters and you can dial them in or out, make changes. Right. And I was like, wow, this is really easy. <laughs> this is a lot simpler than I, unfortunately it didn't work. <laughs> didn't actually fix the problem. What I learned yeah. is you can't use EQ to fix physics problems. Right. right. You can't use a digital solution to fix an analog problem. So, yeah. I don't think people realize. They think they can get DSP and room correction. They can correct for their room errors, and you can't. Those, it'll do something. You know, uh, it, it, in the low it frequency will ranges, some stuff, but it the, won't fix it. Completely. Yeah, in the lower ranges where you, everything's more omnidirectional, you can change the amplitude in that region, and you, you're changing it overall. But yeah. If you got a peak at 3K or something like that, you can turn it down at 3K, but that reflection's still there. It is. It's still coming from an area in the room that you don't want it to come from. There's just no oh, yeah. fixing it. Oh yeah, yeah. As I proved to myself over the course of about three, it was a three-year intensive process for me to exhaust every technical possibility I could with box speakers. Um, and so then I started going back to the show because I was like, ah. I want to, I'm, I'm like, I feel like I could do better, but um, nothing is really working with my current approach. So let me see what else is out there. And that was when I think open baffle speakers first started. Uh, and I think yeah. it was the year, it was the year before you did the, the Super V, right? Okay. So that hadn't quite happened yet. Um, but I was looking for a different solution that could fix the issue without me resorting to these really, uh, complicated EQ schemes that I've been trying to work through. Um, and so I didn't see anything that first year, but then the second year you did the Super V and it fixed the issue that I had with most other OB speakers that I heard up until that time. Most OB speakers, they suck in the bass. They're just, like I can fart more bass than most OB speakers mm -hmm. can produce. <laughs> Yeah, and so, all of a sudden you just heard speakers that had servo-controlled woofers on the bottom. Yeah. Played flat to 20 hertz. Exactly. A so whole like, different ball game. That sounds like something interesting. So yeah. about the smaller scaled down version, which was the V2, yeah. and I built it. I, you know, I didn't do it alone. I had help. There was a guy, local woodworker, helped me. But it turned out pretty well. It's not super complicated. Right. And I put it up there. I can't convey my, how happy and angry I was at the same time. Because within 30 seconds, yeah. all of my issues were fixed, right? Okay. All of the base problems completely solved. And I'm like, oh my God, this is awesome. Why have I wasted the last three years? This is ridiculous. <laughs> That's true. So it was crazy. Like it was just a more elegant solution for the issue um, that I've been seeing. And, and what I've realized since then is I'm not alone. Like my room was not unique. Every room true. has issues. Yeah. And so I've been an OB person ever <clears throat> since then. Um, and I've been a DIY person yeah. ever since then because I'm like, oh, I did that. I can certainly can do, do more. And what everybody told me, which was, you know, hey, Wilson Watt puppies or the contours or, you know, these really big dynamic box speakers are the best you're ever going to hear. That might be true if you have a dedicated room sure. that you built from scratch with like golden ratios, sure. right? Like that might be true, but I'm not that person. Even at the shows, I mean, we'd go to the shows and a lot of those speaker companies you just mentioned, would you'd walk in the room and 
they have really boomy bass, and it would overwhelm everything. You'd think, oh, that's true. I just hate listening to it. And in our case, we just balance out the servo subs in the lower end, which didn't lo load the room to begin with, really. Right, exactly. You just balance out the amplitude, and we were flat. We should do a tech talk where we just talk about bass. Yeah. Like, that's what we should do next, because there's that's a whole topic, and that's there's true. a lot to know. Yeah, and you moved up from the V2s. You're now at, with Super 7s. Yes. So it took a few more years, but eventually, Danny... So I was like, I liked the Super V. The bass was certainly world-changing, like, game-changing, like, better than anything yeah. else. Like, it was one of those things where I was like, why is nobody else using this? Because sometimes a better solution is just flat out better than yeah. everything else. And in the base, that was true. But I have to confess, I didn't like the top part of the Super Vs. They were a little rough. A little rough. Those pro drivers, uh, a little too unrefined. Those were, those were a fun. Yeah, they were rock and roll. They speakers. were a rock and roll speaker. But uh, two, one year, two years later, you came with a Super, Super 7, Seven, which had the planar mic. Which had these, yeah. the planar, and and finally. The top end was just as capable as the bottom end, which yeah. means... What, that was by, a great speaker. All right, let me qualify that. When I say just as good, the bass is best in the world. It is. And now, with the Super 7s, or these, the line swords? Yeah, line, line forces. Line forces. Um, yeah. The planar magnetics match the bass in every way, so you get a perfectly balanced right. speaker, top to bottom, that is... Like, I've heard... At this point, I've heard everything. I've yeah. heard everything from everyone for decades. Yeah, I mean, and I can tell you're 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 at that level now. You're you've got a, one of the top level systems now. Yeah. Speakers and electronics. You brought some of your gear in that we played yeah, with. Yeah. And we had a lot of. He's got some really nice sounding amps, and we could hear instantly the differences for everything we did from a cable change to the amps and how they sounded and because of the level of the system and we were playing everything we, he's yeah. he got to hear everything while yeah. he was here. I, listen, I made it a point to listen to every single speaker in this yeah. room so he'll probably post a little something I'll later do some write-ups yeah. something on it to give some feedback but uh, which reminds me of ron ron Burnet, who hosts all this at new record day he has the uh Exoticus, which are the ones over my shoulder here and he's gone through a similar journey He's gone now to open baffle, and he's, as I say, ruined. Also, you kind of get ruined. You get a, you reach a level to where you realize now you walk into Rocky Mountain or some of the big shows, and you're like, eh, you know, everything else can, because it's just not at the same level in some ways. And I think that is true. Like you, you have standards that escalate as you. Like, yeah, it's you, not just me. I think it's anybody in the hobby. Yeah. Like as you've escalated time. to a top level, and Tyson's, Tyson's reached that level, and Ron. At New Record Day, he's reached that level. He really has reference level systems. And when he reviews stuff, even when he reviews budget gear, he still has a standard where he knows what the capabilities are. Yes. So I really respect him as a reviewer for that reason. Right. And and when I first uh, realized what he was doing, Ron was doing these video reviews. It was just so refreshing. It was like you, when you and Pess first started, you were you were enthusiastic yeah, and you had and you had was, no accountability to anyone right? oh, yeah, and just, that's true you could just say what you want and here ron he's so honest and he could just say anything and now he's developed a big audience of course yeah so he's trying to uh be um tactful in what he says but still be an honest reviewer and, yes but he, so he's and he's balancing that pretty well it's a, you know what I, I couldn't do it like, it's tough I, it's, I it's tough yeah and he's he's doing a really good job and i could see as he started doing this this is it. I mean, as an industry, this is how we reach the next generation because they're not reading those magazines anymore. No. You know, I mean, the review magazines, I don't know where they're going. They might not be around in the four or five more years. I don't know. But this is the way to reach the younger audience. They want instant information. Yes. And you can't hide it. You can't be a creative writer and just turn the speakers on and just start writing fluffy stuff. You can't do that in a video review. I mean, they're going to know from the way you're talking about the speaker, whether you're enthusiastic about it or not, you can't hide it. And there you are, you're laying it on the line and that honesty just comes through. Yes. And I think people are hungry for that and it's re really refreshing. Yes. So I think that's where the industry needs to move as far as reviews and stuff. And uh, I applaud him and he's kind of pioneered that, like you guys pioneered the instant information at the shows that no oh, one yeah. was doing. The hot take. The we hot were doing take. the hot take. It was the hot take, man. So, uh, yeah. That was it. For, I guess that's it for this week. All right. It was good, man. It, it was, was fun. Fun talking. Yeah. So, I hope you guys enjoyed it. We were veered a little away from the actual technical stuff to talk about a little 
industry insider stuff a little bit here and talk about reviewers, but yeah, that's just where it went and that's what we ran with. So All right. More next week. Thanks for viewing. See you guys.